our friends. Um, yeah, I'm Tom, and this is my talk. So I'm going to put this slide up. I have no idea what it means. It, I just I love this slide. Um, it's just gibberish. You can you can look at that while I introduce myself. So yeah, my name's Tom. I don't work in InfoSec. I'm a developer. Um, so this is really talking about IoT from a development point of view rather than just hacking stuff. Um, one point, I'm, um, I'm not here on behalf of my company. I haven't put my company name on the slides. It's not that hard to find out who I work for. Some of the things I may mention in this talk may possibly pertain to current or previous employers' products. Please don't run out and start tweeting about this stuff because that would just be embarrassing. Um, if you want to try hacking a product that I may or may not have worked on, please go ahead. You will need to buy it, which is great because that pays my salary. So <laughs> feel free to do that. So IoT. It's the standard slide where we have a definition for IoT. The Internet of Things is the network of physical devices, vehicles, home appliances, and other items embedded within electronics, software, sensors, actuators, and network connectivity, which enable these devices to connect and exchange data. That one's from Wikipedia. You can find hundreds of these definitions online. Bollocks. It's, IoT is just a buzzword that somebody's made up recently. What we're talking about is embedded devices with network connectivity. This is not a new concept. Network devices, uh, sorry, embedded devices have been around for a very long time. Depending on how you define embedded device, it's usually acknowledged the first embedded device was the Apollo guidance computer, which was in the Apollo rockets. First flew in 1966, obviously developed before then. A lot of the devices you hear are being hacked, things like webcams. The first webcam was the Trojan coffee pot in 1991. Again, not really a new concept. Routers get hacked. Routers, the first router was called, the nickname, the bread truck in 1976. These aren't new. They've been around for a long time. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is IoT is a bit of a tire fire. It's, it's causing a lot of problems. It's not going that well. What, what is it about IoT that means we had to define a new buzzword for it? What does it mean when we talk about IoT? Well, firstly, the numbers. Webcams, routers, those kind of things, they've been around for a long time. But the sheer volume of products we're talking about now. I got these estimates. I don't, I don't quite know what definition of IoT they're using. I'm sure you can make the numbers go one way or the other by changing the definition, but yeah. This year they reckon 8.4 billion IoT devices connect to the internet right now. That's a big number. Last year was 6.4 billion. So it's an increase of 30%, 31%. Estimates, 2020, 20.4 20 billion devices. That's an awful lot of devices. So that's one of the problems. Is one of the things that really defines IoT is the sheer volume of devices we're talking about. Longevity. IoT devices are expected to last quite a bit longer than other products. Most, I'm, I'm sure you've all got a mobile phone. Most people tend to replace their phone every maybe two years. If you're a real Apple fanboy, maybe one year. If you tend to drop your phone down the toilet, six months, I don't know. <laughs> IoT devices are expected to last a lot longer. You think about something like a washing machine. You really don't expect to be replacing a washing machine more than every maybe 10 years if you're buying brand new. Um, some products are expected to last even longer than that. These aren't your typical cheap throwaway products. They're expected to last for a while. Pretty much the definition of embedded devices, they have minimal or non-existent UI, some of them. Some of them have more. Um, you think about uh, some of the definitions of IoT include um, electronic cars. Um, they often have quite a big UI. And then you've got things like the light bulb where you've got just nothing at all. It, it's harder to, to interact with the user without them making that decision. And finally, shit security. The security on these things is terrible. Um, now, when I talk about shit security, what am I talking about? Well, I suspect you all heard of the Mirai botnet. It was the sort of the big 
news that IoT is rubbish, which didn't really come as a surprise to other people. Roughly 200,000 devices in the original botnet. Um, since the source code release, it's actually grown, although it's not much use anymore. It's sort of fragmented because people are using different bits of it. But it was able to generate these enormous DDoS attacks, firstly on Krebs, secondly on DIN. Big numbers, 623 gigabits per second, one terabit per second on DIN. These are, these are big attacks. And all Mirai was, was a set of default credentials for some 60 plus devices where these devices, somebody had hard-coded, uh, in this particular instance, uh, Hanzhou Qingmai, I think, devices all had the default username and password on Telnet. So first of all, they'd left Telnet turned on, and secondly, they had these hard-coded passwords. I don't think you could actually change them. You wouldn't actually wanted to. And, and the other thing that made that bad was these were white-labeled devices, so they weren't selling those devices themselves. They were selling them to other manufacturers to either rebadge or put into other products. Mirai's kind of been and gone. We've now possibly got Reaper. It's based in part on Mirai. It's using those same default credentials. They've added a bunch of other attacks for uh, routers and some surveillance cameras, kind of high-end webcams. These are a little bit more advanced, using things like buffer overflows in those products. Most of these have be already been patched but very few people are upgrading the devices, partly because of that minimal UI. You, it's very difficult to tell if the device has an upgrade available unless you're actually logging into it and having a look. Estimates for Reaper are a bit vague at the moment. Um, somewhere between 10 and 20,000 devices and a million devices, depends on who you ask. Hasn't yet been used in the wild. I would guess it's pretty much guaranteed to go off when risk, risky business goes on holiday, because that's usually when things turn to shit. Um, there's this other one, Hajime. Hajime is really interesting. It's a more sophisticated implementation that has a better control com command and control process. But the really bizarre thing is when a device gets taken over by the Hajime botnet, a, a message appears on the terminal that says, just a white hat securing some systems which suggests that maybe someone has actually written a botnet to go and capture these devices before anyone else does, so they can't be used by the bad guy. Or it's a bad guy just pretending. We don't know. So Hajime, something like 300,000 devices, also not yet used. So it may turn out to be malicious. We just don't know. So. Why are these products so shit? Well, I'm a developer. I work for a company, a company has a budget, a company has resource developers to work on things. You have a choice. Do I want my developers to work on security issues? Or do I want them to work on making cheap products, adding features, fixing existing bugs? You tend to go with the new models and features. It's as simple as that. There's no real benefit right now to fixing security. There's no real legal requirement. There's nothing that says you can't ship this product because the security shit. Some of this is being discussed in the US and Europe, but it's not really clear how this would work yet. It's not really feasible for every single product to go through some sort of government certification process. Maybe it would be a voluntary thing. It's difficult to say. There are some things, um, the FTC is currently suing D-Link, I don't know if it's gonna be successful or not, over their insecure routers and webcams. It's possible that that might be enough to scare the industry into making things better. I doubt it because the rate at which they're suing people is just, it's a pretty good gamble that you're not gonna get hit. There's no consumer interest in security. You can't sell a product with security as a feature, charge more for it and expect people to pay for more for it. You can put security on the box as a word, and I'm pretty sure marketing people do that all the time with no real justification for it at all. Oh, this is a secure webcam. It's exactly the same as the other webcam, but it costs 20 bucks more. Um, there is, I think Australia and possibly some other countries are discussing this idea of a security rating scheme. So it's similar to when you buy a washing machine and it's got the, the thing on the front that shows you how much water it uses per load would be some idea of a, a star scheme or something like that, saying well, you've got one star because you've managed to turn off Telnet, two stars because you provide updates or something like this. 
three stars because you've actually used a hash. I, 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 something along those lines. And that would encourage consumers to actually go for the, the more secure products. Maybe that might work. But the other problem is uh, companies drop products, like end-of-life products. Companies go bust. Well, they get bought and then shut down. And there's no real way of, of maintaining support for a product once the company who made it disappears. Maybe you could have something where you put the source code and the keys to that product in escrow, and if the company goes bust, you can then get access to it so you can maintain support. It's not something I've ever seen done. And the other thing is some bits of hardware, you have the ability to install your own firmware. So OpenWRT is a pretty well-known open source version of uh, Linux that you can install on routers so you can um, like set up the router the way you want to do it. But there are some limitations of what hardware allows you to install. We'll talk about that a little bit. So in my slides, I actually said that OWASP top 10 for IoT was new. It's not new, actually. I, I realized it was actually posted up there in 2014. And obviously, no one's read it yet. Um, but let's go through it anyway. It's still relevant. So number one, insecure web interface. Now, uh, I'm not really sure about the ordering here. Insecure web interface seems unusual to put it at number one because a lot of IoT products don't have a web interface. But I kind of see where they're going with this. Um, attacker uses weak credentials, captures plain text credentials, or enumerates accounts to access the web interface. Pretty obvious stuff. The references up here, um, this was written in 2014. They referenced the OWASP top 10 from 2013. I've updated the references to the, the most recent 2017 one, which I think was finalized last week. So you can talk about what they're talking about. Injection, cross-site scripting, cross-site forgery, uh, request forgery, the, the standard web interface problems. Although I'm not, uh, I'm not sure how many IoT devices where you get things like SQL injection. A lot of IoT devices don't really have databases on them. So again, I'm not sure how relevant that one is. Um, on a product I may or may not have worked at in the past, um, our web interface is just based on the standard BusyBox web server with some CGI scripts, uh, with some shell scripts for the CGI stuff. It's really, really basic stuff. Um, and I'm quite sure those shell scripts have got bugs and security bugs. And, um, and if you really want, you can have a look at them and tell me. Number two, insufficient authentication and authorization. I kind of think this is where Mirai starts to fit in. Having um, Telnet open with default credentials, that's, that's a pretty good example of insufficient authorization. Um, that, um, yes, and you, you can see how that is going to be an obvious problem you need to fix. Insecure network services. Attack uses vulnerable network services to attack the device itself or bounce attacks off the device. So this is pretty standard stuff. Unnecessary open ports. UPnP, obviously, is a problem, exposing ports to the internet. Um, and then you get these weird ones like Wi-Fi access to the network. And what I'm talking about here is, in particular, there was a product a couple of years ago called iKettle. It was an internet-connected kettle. I, you often hear people say, why on earth would you make something like this? The question to bring, brings to my mind, why on earth would you buy this? What possible use case do you have for an internet connected kettle and it did occur to me earlier um, after seeing the earlier talk about the uh, light bulb or IoT light bulb maybe all of these products are being bought by pen testers who are writing conference talks <laughs> maybe there's a business model there I don't know the problem with the eye kettle was you I think there was a mobile app or something and you enabled the kettle to, con to connect to your house Wi-Fi by giving it the SSID and a password the problem was the kettle didn't check that the SSID was using the same level of encryption that it was previously. So you could use a stronger signal with the same SSID, knock the kettle off the house Wi-Fi, it would then connect to your Wi-Fi, but you didn't have encryption turned on, and it just gave you the password for the hack. So there you go, you've got cred. Pretty stupid bug. It did occur to me that I should probably check my source code. Guess what? Same bug. It's, it's an easy mistake. It didn't occur to me that you might have an SSID 
without the same level of encryption turned on, so you just present the password to it. And I wouldn't be surprised to find there's a bunch of other products out there that have the same bug in. And a part of the problem with, with embedded devices is you're not relying on existing software like Android or something like this. You're writing this stuff yourself. So the same mistakes get made over and over again. Okay, not as dumb as leaving your telnet turn on with default cred, but I can imagine this is a common bug. Lack of transport encryption, integrity, verification. Um, this is really about um, the data being passed possibly between devices on your network. So maybe you've got a bunch of um, light bulbs and they talk to each other or something like that, something along those lines. The problem here is that the solutions we have right now for encryption, most of, we, uh, most of them are relying on internet access. They're all built for websites and things like this. And the problem is you can't guarantee that these products are going to be connected to the internet. There are lots of situations where you take an IoT product and you connect it, you've got your IoT light bulb, you connect it up in your house on a local network because you're security person, you don't want to expose these to the internet, and then you use your phone on the same local network, and they never connect to the internet, which is fine, except if you're relying on being able to get upgrades or new certificates when the old ones expire. You've also got the problem of some of these products get made and then left in a warehouse for a couple of months, and then you get them out of the box, and all of a sudden, um, they've been in a box for five years, and the certificates on them have expired, and then you connect to the internet, and they don't work. So you can't just make those same assumptions about products that you can on the internet. There are even more complications when you actually want different products made by different manufacturers to connect together. I'm on a standards committee for some domain specific stuff where we're talking about different manufacturers making products that want to communicate together in an encrypted way. How do you manage that? Especially when those products may never get connected to the internet. It's quite difficult. And if you really want to know about this stuff, go and watch Ryan's talk from Christchurch Hackathon. It's worth it because he explains PKI with emoji, which is impressive in itself. So, moving swiftly on, privacy concerns. Obviously a major one, the data that gets collected by these devices, is it being stored securely? Now I said there's no legal re uh, requirements for releasing IoT products, but stuff like this is starting to come under a legal framework. So especially in the EU, the GDPR, which kicks off, I think, on the 25th of May next year, so not long now, um, has these requirements for things like uh, user consent and pseudo anonymization of data. Interesting, there's a legal ob obligation to notify the authority in a debated breach within, I think it's within 72 hours, which is really interesting because, especially if you look at the case for Uber, they covered up their data leak, they didn't want to tell anyone about it. They're now, well, in the Europe anyway, if you're collecting data on European citizens, which Uber, Uber obviously do, they would be obliged to, to tell the authorities within 72 hours of finding the breach. And the fines for this stuff are pretty impressive. 20 million euros, that's 34 million New Zealand dollars, or up to 4% of the annual worldwide turnover, whichever is greater. Now, there are companies that are making more than 35 million dollars four percent of their annual turnover. So these fines can be really significant. Maybe this is what starts to really kick off the privacy process. But this is just the storing of the data online. This does not affect the devices themselves. Insecure cloud interface, an obvious one. Probably not as bad as it sometimes is. Obviously to connect to the cloud you have to be on the internet, so you should have access to updates. Um, most of the cloud providers are doing a reasonable job of providing security if you stick with stuff like AWS. It's not too hard. Insecure mobile interface. This is a little bit more complicated. Um, I put Bluetooth in here because an obvious one, when you have a mobile app, you want to be able to connect your mobile device to the device you're talking to. You might be using Bluetooth. And I'm being very frustrated with the amount of information there is about how to make Bluetooth secure. What's best practice? The Bluetooth SIG, of which we are a member, released uh, this app called Launch Studio quite recently, which helps you to configure your Bluetooth products. Not so much phones and stuff, more like when you're making an actually embedded device that's got Bluetooth built in. And they had a webcast for this thing, and I actually asked them the question, does this help me check for security best practice? No. Is there a security best practice for Bluetooth that you publish? No. 
So, I mean, they, they kind of invite this stuff themselves. The best guide I've found is actually published by NIST, but even that is kind of out of date because Bluetooth 5 just being, has been released. Insufficient security configurability. I'm not sure this applies to IT devices, uh, sorry, IoT devices a huge amount. It, you tend to have the security they come with. This doesn't tend to be a huge amount of configuration in there. Insecure software and firmware. Again, I'm in somewhat two minds about this one. If you completely lock down your device with secure boot and encrypted uh, firmware and things like that, it means that no one can then ever be able to replace the firmware with something they genuinely want to use. And that's kind of one of those ongoing arguments. If I've paid for the hardware, don't I have the right to do with it what I want? And I suspect this one's going to go on for a while. Poor physical security. I mean, this is an obvious one. I remember um, Matthew Garrett hacking a DVD player in KiwiCon a couple of years ago by basically putting a file on the, D on the SD card and it, it read the file and turned off the security and God knows what. So that's the OWASP top 10 priority. It, most of it's kind of obvious, but it's good to have it written down somewhere. So it's really important to be able to get firmware updates for these products. So I mentioned earlier, um, Reaper is including those nine attacks for devices where they don't, um, th these, these issues have been patched, but a lot of customers just aren't applying the patches, and so these devices remain in the wild, and they're still vulnerable. So you need to be able to update the firmware. The problem is, as I said, a lot of these devices don't have some sort of UI, so they're not just going to be able to pop up a message saying, please update me. Often the user has, to, the, the owner has to go and log into the device or something to be able to see there's an update available. So the obvious solution there is to make the updates automatic. Well, that's all very well, but you've got to be very careful when you're updating devices in the wild. And if it's a washing machine, okay, the washing machine knows when it's actually doing the washing cycle. If it's just sitting there not doing anything at all, then it could probably do an update itself without too much worry. But if you're talking about things like cars, um, industrial control systems, you can't just update them just like that. There needs to be some sort of synchronization there. So it, it really depends on the device you're talking about. It needs to be tested on all hardware variants. Now this, this is something I think a lot of people don't quite understand. When you make a product and you start manufacturing it, you don't just stop. Products constantly evolve. Probably the biggest thing we have to deal with is changes to um, NAND. So a few years ago, all of the fabs switched from 42 nanometer to 21, and then the more recently they started been switching to 19. So the chips you're using in the product go end of life, and you have to replace them with new chips. And sometimes it's a new generation of flash, and you need to upgrade your kernel to be able to get the support in for flash drivers and that kind of thing. Hardware evolves. There was a product I may or may not have been involved in a few years ago where we actually upgraded the CPU and then we slowed down the clock speed because the new CPU was faster than the old one. So the two products looked the same. It sounds nuts, but we didn't want customers going into a shop and buying two products and finding one of them was running faster than the other. It didn't make any sense to them just because one of them has been on a shelf for six months and one of them has just come straight from the factory. So you end up with this sort of legacy support of a whole bunch of different hardware variants in the field. There was a case quite recently where a company called Lockstate had these internet collecting locks, which were recommended by Airbnb, and they did a firmware update and bricked a whole bunch of them. Bricked them to the point where they had to be returned to the manufacturer so they could fix them. Sounds like a funny story, but I'm pretty sure that what happened was they had a bunch of different hardware variants in the field they tested the update on some of those variants, didn't realize it was going to brick the other ones, and did the update over the air. And this is a problem that has to be dealt with. If you're talking about, say, you are a company that's been going for a few years, you ship maybe 30 different products, um, you have got between 1 and 10 hardware variants of all of those 30 products, and then you want to do a software release across all of them, that's quite a bit of testing that has to be done just to make sure you're not bricking them. That doesn't even make sure that there aren't any bugs in the software. So it's a big overhead. The download path needs to be secure. Now, obviously, if you're connected to the internet to be able to get the downloads, you can use TLS to, to verify who you're talking to. 
you can use certificates to make sure the security the software has been signed. But as I said, if that product's been sitting in a warehouse for five years and the certificate bundle's expired, then maybe it can't even connect your server to download the update with this fresh set of certificates in. There's, uh, there's also a case quite recently, the Logitech Harmony Link. Logitech end of life this product quite unexpectedly. And the rumor is that this was because they used an Equifax root certificate and the root certificate was lost and suddenly they had absolutely no control over the security of their product. And the easiest thing for them to do was to brick it. I don't know if that's true or not, but I can see exactly how that happens. You choose a certificate authority and suddenly you find out five years later that they're well dodgy and you can't rely on them. These are all problems that are going to be coming up. And the other thing is the update path needs to be secure. Supply side attacks are happening quite a bit, especially this year. There's been um, CCleaner, where a signed version of their software was put up on their website, which included malware. Um, Medoc was the um, accountancy software that contained the Petya malware that was released in um, Eastern Europe. Um, Mint, uh, Linux Mint transmission, which is a BitTorrent client, all of these have been basically shipped off a server or a website containing malware. And again, if somebody hacks into your servers and enables to put a, some sort of malware into your software, how do you stop that happening? Especially if they've got access to the build server, which contains the signing certificate for your software. It looks valid. But until someone actually checks, you don't know it's happened. Now, I did read a paper a while back, I, unfortunately I couldn't find the reference, where someone came up with this idea of having multiple certificates. You sign your software with, say, three different certificates, and each of those certificates is held by a different person. So in order to release the software, it has to go through each individual person to get signed off. Probably very secure, quite difficult to implement in the real. How do you, how do you get that running through a build system? What happens when one of those people goes on holiday? What happens when one of them loses the YubiKey they had the key stored on or something like that? It's, it's one of those problems. I don't really know how you fix that one, but server-side attacks are, uh, sorry, supply-side attacks are becoming more common, and it's going to be a problem. What's the point of hacking the device when you can hack their server and own all of the devices in one go? So, that's my summary. IoT is going to get worse before it gets better. There are 8.4 billion devices out there, an awful lot of which have got crap security. There are devices in development right now that are going to be released shortly that also have crap security. And frankly, that's going to keep happening because developers are stupid. I'm a developer. I'm stupid. I make these kind of problems all the time. It's, it's easy to do. That example of the Wi-Fi connection problem I was talking about, it, it was just an oversight on my part, but it happened. One product I may or may not have worked on, um, the first time we shipped it, I put the root certificate for the particular certificate we were using on the website so I could connect to the website. And then a year later, the web guys replaced that certificate with a certificate from a different provider, and our product stopped being able to connect. And I emailed them and said, what are you doing? We've, we've got to get the certificate from the same provider. And they said, no, we can't, because that certificate was 128-bit, and we have to replace it with 256. We had to go back to the original provider, pay them additional money to get a 128-bit certificate for the next year so we could make sure the products would update in the field to be able to support the new provider. You can't just rely on being able to use the same certificate authority over and over again. So now we build in a, a bundle, which is better, but as I said, if your product then ends up on the shelf for five years, you can't always rely on the certificates in the bundle. Some of our products are going to have bundles which contain a valid Equifax certificate, and until we upgrade them, we can't really do anything about that. So yeah, we need help. I, I mean, some of this stuff, yeah, taking out 10 at default credentials, I mean, yeah, come on. It, it's easy, it's so obvious, it's frustrating how anyone managed to do this stuff. But some of these more complex problems don't have solutions yet. How do you deal with expiring certificates? How do you deal with devices that may not be connected to the internet wanting to communicate with each other on private networks? I'm still kind of waiting for someone to, to figure this one out. Maybe it's gonna be me, it's more likely it's gonna be Ryan. Um, I just don't know. 
And the other thing is it would be really great to have some CI tools for this stuff. Um, the one I've been thinking about or trying to find a solution for actually is I want to be able to do man in the middle testing on my product to make sure I haven't screwed up the TLS stuff. But it would be really great if I could make that part of our build process so every time I do a build, it then runs that check. And I'm sure it's possible to do. I haven't found a tool that will do it for me yet. And I suspect anyone who has done this just hasn't shared it out yet, and maybe I'm gonna have to write my own or hack something together. But these kind of tools would be really, really useful. So not so much you get the product right first time, but you can then make sure you're gonna get right every time you do a change. <coughs> and finally, I don't know what's gonna happen with these botnets. I d the idea of like a white hat versus black hat botnet fight, it, it's, I don't know, I reckon there's a movie on there somewhere. Come on, they made the emoji movie. This is actually, you know. So yeah, I mean, maybe Hajime turns out to be bad, maybe it turns out to be good. Maybe this is an ongoing thing, I don't know. It's gonna be interesting to find out. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions? Well, the EU isn't going to collapse. Sorry, the question was who's pushing the EU regulations. The EU isn't going to collapse. Britain's leaving, probably. Uh, but the rest of the EU is still going quite well. Um, and I mean, even if the EU does collapse, that's just the legal framework. I wouldn't be surprised to find that other countries start adopting something similar. But I mean, even if that particular legislation collapses, I think that's the general trend. People are realizing there needs to be more control around privacy, around data online. What happens to that data? What happens to the companies that are stupid enough to store the password and claim text online? It, we need something to drive these changes because it's not going to happen on its own. Sorry, say that again? That, that legislation kicks in in May next year. Um, I don't know. Yeah, that's uh, um, the, the point was made about Microsoft Open Document Format. The EU had definitely sued companies in the past. They sued Microsoft years ago for Internet Explorer being included with Windows. I think they've sued Google for something similar with, to do with Android. Um, the Microsoft Open Document Format was actually produced as a result of legal threats in that Microsoft had to open up their data. So not so much with privacy, but this kind of stuff has worked in the past. But yeah, I'm not a lawyer, so... Okay, thank you very much.